Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. My former husband and I had taken our children for a picnic at Wellington Lake just south of Buffalo Creek, Colorado. What I saw was not the same as what I've seen in photos, however. What I saw was a bipedal creature with white fur. This may sound strange, but I was talking with my former husband when the creature stepped out from behind a boulder. I told my now ex-husband to look. He turned around, but the creature ducked back behind the boulder. My ex-husband turned back to me and said, I didn't see anything. At that very moment, the creature showed itself to me again. I told my ex to turn around. He did, and the creature ducked behind the boulder again. This happened four or five times, and then the creature was gone. The creature was partially bipedal and then would stoop like an ape and touch the ground. It had a human-like feeling about it, because it was obviously playing some sort of game with me. I have never told anybody, except for people I trust, to not make fun of me. I was a resident in the area for many years, and I knew what wildlife was there. Nothing came close to this creature. I've seen mountain lion, bobcat, lynx, badgers, deer, elk, bear, and many more creatures in that area. But nothing like this. The creature was very quiet, light on his or her feet. It was not as large as Bigfoot, and the fur was pure white like a polar bear. I didn't get a clear vision of its face. This was not a polar bear. We lived in Colorado. We lived in Colorado, where there were only black bears. In addition, the creature was obviously clever and had a sense of humor and intelligence that was human-like. Again, it was not incredibly tall, maybe five foot nine or so. It wasn't a person playing a prank either. It was too agile and too fast. And that area is wilderness area. Very difficult for a human to scamper around so quickly. Over boulders and up mountains, etc. Unfortunately, I was the only witness. I am perfectly sane. And I am educated with a master's degree in education, instructional technology. I'm the type of person that has my feet set directly onto the earth. In other words, I don't believe in anything that I can't see. I don't take drugs. And I didn't take drugs then either, nor did I drink alcohol. I would like to know if anybody else has seen this creature or a creature similar to it. I was too embarrassed to mention the incident to cowboy types in that area. I've always wanted to know what I had witnessed, but too afraid to mention it because it was different than the photos I've seen of Bigfoot. It was in the afternoon, around 2 to 3 p.m., on to the next one. At the time, I was a resident of Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Each elk season, we would put up an elk camp about 15 miles horseback only northwest of Strawberry Park in the Mount Zirkle Wilderness area. On the opening morning, we were kept in camp by a rather heavy wet snow that did not stop until around 10 a.m., at which time the sun came out and we saddled up our horses to take a quick look for elk tracks, intending to return to camp for a quick lunch. On my return to camp, I cut a set of tracks that looked like a big barefoot person had passed by. These tracks were about 12 to 13 inches long with only four toes that I could see in a broad arch and eel area. I returned to camp and brought the camp cook back to look at them since they crossed the creek only about a hundred yards from our tent. I decided to follow the track and found where the creature had stood on the other side of the creek, milling about as if trying to decide where to go. The tracks led uphill through the black timber, which I followed for about half an hour. The tracks had begun to interest my horse a great deal. He kept sniffing the track and became more and more skittish until, in an area of several big blowdowns, 
he refused to go any further and began to show signs of panic, which of course was transmitted to me. I took a hard left into a big avalanche area, which I followed for about 300 or 400 yards. The black timber, which I had just left, began to turn into aspens, so I cut back, hoping to require the track. Whatever it was, it was still in the black timber, spruce trees, and I didn't have much heart to go in and look. End of my story. I am an experienced woodsman. I have spent lots of times in the high country, on horseback, and have never encountered any tracks like these. And the horse in question I had was a great mountain horse, was not gun-shy or spooky in any way. His skittish behavior was the biggest reason I gave up the hunt on the track. He lived to be 40 years old and was with me from the time he was nine months. The only other witnesses were just the camp cook, my wife. It was around noon on a clear blue sky after a morning snowstorm in typical Colorado high country with open parks, aspens, and black timber. Quite mountainous, of course. On to the next one. I moved to Castle Rock with one of my close relatives. The house was in town, so it took a little bit more to get at where I love to be. And that was out in the woods. My neighbor was my same age and shared the same interests as I. That entire summer, we spent fishing, hiking, camping, and off-roading in the Devil's Head Rampart Range area. I remember that we had tried to get into the area during the early spring. We had no luck with a two-wheel drive car. Around April, I purchased a four-wheel drive. We got in a few weeks after that. I remember going in because there was still snow still on the ground. When we got out of the Jeep to our soon-to-be new home away from home, there were several tracks going through our campsite. The odd thing about the tracks and my first impression were, what idiot took off his shoes to go hiking? The second odd thing, which I guessed it should have given me a clue is, but it didn't at the time, at least one and a half of my feet fit inside each print in the snow. And third, we were the first ones into the immediate area that spring. No one should have been hiking through here. Anyway, we had an enjoyable summer there. The last few fishing trips we took along with us a few girls who also liked to fish. On the last trip, Sunday afternoon on September, the fish were not biting and the sun was starting to drop low into the horizon. The sun illuminated the hillside adjacent to where we were fishing. Since I was bored with the fishing, I went to relax on the tailgate of my jeep, just laying there and looking at the hillside. All of a sudden, two trees stepped out of the forest and out onto the rocks on the adjacent hillside above. These were no trees. These were no bears. These things were big. They were dark, swung their arms, and walked upright. At first, my buddy and I thought it was some kind of joke. Some jerks were trying to mess with us. We yelled out to them. We tried calling them names to piss them off. Nothing worked. However, they disappeared around some big rocks, one of the girls swear she saw them heading down the hillside toward us. At that point, it was pure pandemonium. We threw as much fishing and cook gear into the jeep as we could. We still ended up leaving half of it there. That night, one of the girls brought over her dad's 38 snub nose revolver. We were going to go back for the rest of our gear and to look around for the walking trees. Shortly after she left my house, that night, my nosy relative found the revolver in my jeep. The relative called the police. I tried like hell to explain this one to the cops. The cops thought that we were up to no good that day. None of us did that sort of thing. That was a real kick below the belt coming from the cops. The other girl's father was a county sheriff. She was not allowed to hang out or fish with us ever again, even though she saw the same things as the rest of us did. The girl that brought over the gun, she told her brother about what we saw. He told her that he had been at a large outdoor party in that area about a month prior. Everyone there was drinking. He said that when he went to relieve himself behind some bushes, he walked right into one of these creatures. He dismissed the whole event and blamed it on the alcohol he had consumed. March rolled around. Day trips to the woods were kept restricted to a closer radius of a home. Another Sunday, 
my buddy and I were out exploring a site between Castle Rock and Franktown where an old dam once had been. Many years prior, the dam broke, creating a huge cavern in the stream bed that runs through. The caverns were neat for exploring. The sun was starting to go down, and it was getting cold. It was time to leave. We were clawing our way through thigh-high snow on the north side of the cavernous stream bed back to the car. About a half mile away from the car, we noticed a black object lying in a sandbar in the stream bed. We clawed our way over to the upper ledge of the stream bed. On the sandbar below was lying a head, a big decaying head. Lying on its side, it looked like an overgrown human's head with black shaggy hair on it. The eyes, lips, and nose were already gone. The head had massive square teeth running throughout the upper and lower jaw. I have seen all kinds of skulls before, from both wild and domestic animals alike. I have never seen another skull like this before or since. A human skull is the closest match to it that I've seen or can compare it to. To this day, I wish I would have braved the cold and cold water and waited out to get the head. Quite a few years after my experiences in Colorado, I've learned about the North American Bigfoot. Had I known about this in my youth, I might have been an indoor lover. I now have no real desire to go plundering through the woods as I used to do. My experiences were real and genuine. I now believe that Bigfoot was in my life more than I knew. On to the next one. Footprints were sighted by myself and a friend while winter camping behind Pikes Peak near Colorado Springs, Colorado. A friend and myself were winter camping in Pike National Forest outside of Colorado Springs. I don't really recall exactly what month of the year it was, but there was still abundant snow cover all around our camp area. After breakfast on a sunny morning, we decided to explore the area. The snow in the area was in many places up to our waists. After trekking through deep snow, we came upon a trail that was located on a rise from the valley floor. We followed the trail for a short distance when we came upon some very large footprints. Thinking how strange these footprints looked, the size and shape, we knew that they were not of any animal that we knew of. These footprints looked human except that they were very large. What would a barefoot, huge person be doing way out here in the middle of winter? We were thinking. We followed the footprints for a while until we came to an area where two adjacent mountains joined. At that place, the snow became very deep and impossible for us to continue. The footprints, however, continued right up the area, never breaking stride and not overly disturbing the unbroken snow. After returning home and telling our story to our friends and families and being met with disbelief, we didn't discuss our sighting again until now. The footprint sightings were in the mountainous region about 7,000 to 8,000 feet behind Pikes Peak. A heavy snow covered most of the ground. On to the next one. Dispatch had sent out a call asking all available units to report to the scene of a domestic dispute. A woman was calling for help saying that her husband was going to kill her with a sword. Now, any type of law enforcement officer will tell you that these are the worst types of calls to go on. Nationwide, many officers have been shot trying to defuse such situations. As soon as the call came over the radio, I was on my way with two other units. As I arrived at the location, which was a house trailer located deep into a wooded lot, car 605 was ahead of me. We got out of the cars and went to the door with our guns drawn. We could hear that there was a heated dispute still going on inside of the home, including lots of cursing and yelling coming from a man and woman. My partner pounded on the door shouting police while I watched standing off to one end of the trailer's home. Just after he knocked, the female voice shouted, Good, they're here. Now you're going to jail, you lowlife creep. Sounds after this, I heard a crash from the backside of the home which was followed by the sighting of a man running out into a field while wearing nothing but a pair of shorts and sneakers, having forced his way out, jumping through a window. I shouted to my partner that we had a runner 
and started in pursuit of the man just as the third unit was arriving. Upon seeing me give chase to the man, the third officer started driving out into the field with his bronco in pursuit of the same. It had been about 4 p.m. in the afternoon when the pursuit began, as I heard over the radio that the man was unarmed. I stumbled and fell, and at virtually the same time, the bronco had reached a deep furrow that the truck could not cross. Now that officer and myself were both on foot chasing after this guy. The runner had already reached the wood, and additional backup was on the way as the two of us joined forces, entering the forest together. We spaced ourselves about 40 yards apart and started walking in. Now, a running man going into a desolate forest wearing only a pair of shorts is not going to last very long. I must have been several hundred yards into the forest when I came across a creek and I radioed to my partner about the find. There was a slight embankment comprised of some moist brown soil that appeared drier as you moved away from the water. After I told my partner about the creek, he moved forward, coming across it himself. This officer was now going to move easterly, looking for tracks the man might have left while crossing the creek, and I was going to follow behind him. Both of us believed that he had gone more in my partner's direction, as I was closing the gap between where I had started and where my partner had begun. I came across some gigantic impressions by the creek's edge. The impressions were so fresh that they were still filling with water from the wet soil. One of them looked to be two or even three feet deep, and the prints had to have been close to two feet long and very wide. I radioed my partner immediately, telling him to backtrack to my position. We stood there, examining the, examining the track, and we could see one more print on the other side of the creek as well, indicating that something had crossed the creek here. Now, just so you can visualize this, the creek was about a foot deep at its deepest point and maybe 12 feet wide in total, including several feet of bank on either side, and there was no way that these tracks were those of the man we were chasing. We both walked through the water into the woods following the tracks, maybe 40 feet into the woods on the other side. We found a sneaker, and at this point, there was no reason for the two of us to go any further while alone. We retreated back to the field and my trailer. Our reinforcements had arrived already, and I presented the sneaker to the wife, who confirmed it was her husband. With the assistance of another agency, our office began a manhunt. We stalked out the various roads and areas where the man would eventually have to emerge, knowing that he couldn't last long in the woods with no clothing and one sneaker. After several days, the man had not been seen or taken into custody, and the wife said that she hadn't seen him in or near the property, and neither she nor any of their relatives had heard from him. During this time, the giant impression by the creek had been the topic of much discussion, as well as the sneaker we had found. Some felt that the print had been enlarged by the softness of the creek's edge, even after I had insisted they were not, since I had seen them within moments of when they had been made. After the passage of about two years' time, this turned into a missing person's case. The man still had not been seen in all that time. About three years later, some hunters came across human skeletal remains about five miles north of where the case had begun. They had been hunting in some thick timbers and found the bones in a patch of tangled briars. After the report, the remains were retrieved by our forensic people. After much examination, we believed that the bones belonged to our missing man. DNA was retrieved from the remaining spouse's child, and it turned up as a match. The skeleton was that of the runaway man from some three years earlier. But here is the real clincher of the story, and why I wrote you in the first place. According to the coroner, the man's skull had been caved in past the mid-sagittal line. In other words, the head had been smashed in more than halfway by blunt force trauma. Now, just to give you an idea of this type of force, if I was to take a full swing at your head with a large baseball bat, I couldn't even come close to this type of impact on your skull. Not even with two or three repeated forceful bows could I create such damage. Also, numerous ribs had been broken via compound fractures. They were all clean fractures where the bone had been broken into two separate pieces. 
all of this must have occurred while the man was in the forest, running and alone. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!